Fish Unfiltered episode 52. I am here joined with Eli Sussman, Isaac Azut. And we have a very special guest here today. We have Skip Schumacher, the manager of the Miami Marlins and 2023 National League Manager of the Year. Skip, thank you so much for hopping on and it's an honor to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's been a while. Hope you guys are good. Off- yeah, we're good. How's the offseason been treating you? Uh, good. I have a 16 year old son and a thir- uh, almost, gosh, just turned 14 year old daughter. Um, so learning to drive, the learning permit, you know, all that stuff is going on. So he gets his license and so he turned 16 on the 25th. So he gets his license here and gosh, what, five days, four days, whatever it is. So it's a little bit nerve wracking. Uh, it's a different stage in life that I'm not ready for. Um, but he's playing a lot of baseball games. So as you know, the season is tough on family. So I'm uh, making up for lost time and trying to be a dad and a husband and trying to get uh, out of my wife's way uh, and try not to bother her. Uh, I think I'm helping, but a lot of times I'm getting in the way. So that's been uh, the adjustment. But other than that, just catching up on uh, um, a lot of family time. Skip, we have a whole lot of Marlins stuff to get into with you. But first off, there was an announcement just a couple of days ago on the Hall of Fame ballot for 2024. Your boy, Matt Holiday is on there for the first time. What do you think? Do you, can you make your case for him to stick around on the ballot a little bit, knowing him as, as well as you did and seeing him play up close as his teammate? Yeah, I'm not as good as, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the guys as far as, um, you know, what the stats and Hall of Fame numbers and war and all that stuff to get into the Hall of Fame. What I do know is um, he was one of the most feared hitters in the game during his time, middle of the order bat. Um, yeah, he played in Colorado, but he had some big years outside of Colorado in St. Louis for six or seven years. Um, an absolute beast. He's a Hall of Fame person. I, I think everybody should know that. I know that's not part of the, the criteria, but as far as a human being, like that family is is uh, 10 out of 10. Um, the, uh, the numbers, man, like we acquired him or I shouldn't say we, uh, the Cardinals acquired him, uh, you know, really for protection for Albert and good luck. That's, that's not an easy task. And he was more than able uh, to protect Albert and we don't win a world series without Matt holiday. And um, he's a winner. Um, but again, I don't know what like those war numbers uh, or whatever it mean, but like for his playing career, he was one of the most feared hitters in a lineup for those 12 or 14 years, however long he played. And so he's on the Hall of Fame. Uh, he should be a Hall of Famer to me. But, you know, I, I, again, I don't know how all those numbers uh, work. All right, well, Skip, as Kevin said, um, you are the National League Manager of the Year. When you reported to spring training with the pitchers and catchers back in February, is that something you could have even imagined that you would have won the award in your first season at the helm? Yeah, the, the last thing that I'm thinking about is, trying to win a manager of the year or any sort of personal award um as great as that is and i said this uh when i ended up winning the award this is a staff award this is a players award like if the players don't go out and play really well if my staff doesn't create a a, you know a change of culture i'm not even on that panel right so um it's more than just me i know i'm the one that gets it but i truly believe that um the staff deserves just as much recognition as i do and then again, the players win you games, right? There's only a couple of times here and there where you make moves that can help you win or lose games. Most of the time I was making moves to lose games. Um, And, you know, a lot of times when we were winning the, uh, you know, the players were covering up for my mistakes. Um, That's the reality of it. And you try to do your best to um, put guys in the right position and, um, you know, more times than not, it it worked out and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. But no, to, to answer your question, like the last thing I'm thinking about is, when I get to, into spring training is, man, how do I win this award? <laughs> like that's, If that's on your mind, man, you shouldn't be managing. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And you did lead this team to the postseason in a traditional year for the first time in 20 years. Uh, I'm sure that's something that's really special. My next question would be, we, re- we rewind to October. Um, when you guys clinched on s- a Saturday in Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly, they're still up in the air where you guys would play in the wild card series, whether you're the six seed, five seed. I'm just curious if were you guys try, looking at that and maybe trying to avoid Philadelphia in the first round, knowing that Milwaukee might be the easier opponent at any stretch, or is it just a focus to get in and that's it? It was to get in. Uh, there are so many different scenarios where we couldn't get in as well. Um, right. But then, uh, yeah, once that happens, like you're just grateful to get in. And I do believe that you get in and see what happens. 
listen, if Woodruff doesn't get hurt and you have Burns, Woodruff, Peralta, that's yeah. not exciting either. So, um, I, you know, there's there's no real like fun rotation to face on a, a three game series when you're looking at it. And that's why, like a lot of those teams that have, you know, Nola and Wheeler at the top, that's really challenging. Right. Or Burns and Woodruff. That's really challenging. Even Peralta is, a, I mean, that guy's a really good pitcher. Yeah. Uh, so no, there's and and they were really good at home as well, uh, in Milwaukee. So I, I don't think there's there's any team that we are scared of, but there's not a team that I was like, oh, I'd rather face this team than the other team. Um, they were all good. when you're in the playoffs um, in that three game set, man, it's hard. And you were going to play on the road, um, and you know we just we happen to play in Philly. That's not easy. And I think I think it was such a great learning experience for a lot of our young players though to to play in that atmosphere. Um, for guys who have not been in the playoffs before, and now they understand it. Um, and I think uh, hopefully the offseason looks different for a lot of those young guys now that they got a taste of that uh, of that playoff uh, experience. Skip, you mentioned a moment ago the manager of the year being a staff award, and a huge part of that staff was Brant Brown as your hitting coach. I know a bunch of the players spoke really positively about him, and of course you were the one that brought him over in the first place. Um He's heading now over to Seattle, I think, moving forward. If you could just help people understand what, what it is that, I guess, made him desirable by other teams, what is it that worked well with the players and makes somebody an effective hitting coach? Because it is kind of hard to see that from afar, from our perspective. Yeah. First of all, whenever you get a, you get a promotion, he's going to be the bench coach now over in Seattle. Um that's a, that's a good thing for our organization. As much as I hate losing guys, um, I'm happy for Brandt. Um, you know, he changed what the hitting philosophy looks like up and uh, up and down the system. Um, you know, brought back uh, you know some ideas, some old school plus some new school ideas where um, it wasn't just all pull launch homers. Um, it was like be a good hitter first, and we'll figure out the other stuff later. Um, he understands what development looks like because he was in PD for a while. Um, he was really good at bringing in and being collaborative all the coaches, minor leagues and big leagues. Um, he set the tone in spring training. He had, I mean, barbecues, um, you know, at uh, the hotels with all the hitting coaches, right? And um, just to get that camaraderie so we could speak the same language up and down the system. And it wasn't just triple A's different than double A, different than A ball. Like every guy in the minor leagues knew what to expect when they got to the big leagues, if they got to the big leagues, because it was, the, uh, the language was the same. Um, he, he and John Mabry and Jason Hart worked really well together. It's a relationship-based game. This is how this thing works. Um, if you don't have those relationships, I don't care what kind of content you have, it's not going to work. Brant had both. Um, he had the relationship skills. Guys spot in right away. They were sick of having down years, and they try to figure out ways to get better. Um, there's so many numbers in today's game that it's easy to get lost in a lot of these numbers and um, and honestly, it can get confusing. Um, and some guys really want a lot of the numbers. Some guys want it as simple as possible. Um, and Brant and Mabry were really good at identifying the guys that needed a lot of information and the guys that needed it dummy down. Brant's one of the smarter guys I've been around baseball wise. Uh, grateful that, you know, we had him, um, but I think he left this place better. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to take a lot of what Brant used um, and apply it this year as well. And looking forward, when it comes to filling his shoes as hitting coach, this is not the type of job that you go to LinkedIn and you, <laughs> you open up an application for a hitting coach. is a little unconventional. It's a lot different than most other jobs. From your perspective, where does that search start? Like, how does that work when you, when you have an opening? Where do you begin to uh, begin to like evaluate who comes in to replace him moving forward? Yeah, I, well, if you think about what happened last year, you know, we hired everybody. <laughs> So, um, you know, I uh, so I think everybody was new. Um, I had re built in relationships with everybody that we hired. Um, and so that's that is meaningful to me, not to say that I am only going to hire guys that I know or work with or uh, played with. Um, but I do know that uh, whoever we do go after is going to be a really good high character person. Um, and then we'll figure out the 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 actual coaching stuff um, later, you know, part of the interview process. Um, internally, Mabry and Hardy speak the same language as Brandt. Um, so that part is going to be really good. Um, now finding somebody to, you know, compliment or oversee whatever. Um, we'll see what kind of direction we we go. We're figure, figuring all that out right now. Um, but I'm we're in a good spot as far as, you know, what these guys want 
Uh, we've asked all the players um, and, and they've given us some ideas. Um, and so we'll, we'll go from there. And lastly, on that topic, do you feel pretty good about retaining the rest of the staff from 2023? Or do you still have to let that process play out with a couple other teams filling out their staffs? Yeah, you let the process play out. Um, again, when you uh, have some success, teams will want your guys. Um, it's just like players, right? When you win, player uh, most likely GMs will want to acquire winning players. Um, and I think that's the same thing with coaches. It's tough to find good coaching. Uh, it, it just, it's true. Um, I saw Tom Brady on a podcast the other day, I think it was Stephen A. Smith maybe talking about how it's, you have to, it's really difficult to find good coaching nowadays. Um, and I believe that is in the major leagues too. You can't just hire anybody from any facility or whatever it is. Like, like it's, it takes a lot of uh, time to figure out uh, managing egos, personalities, and then content. You have to have all three. Um, it's not just like, Hey, just swing this way or just, you know, delivered this way. It, it can't happen. Um, and I think there's it's a relationship based uh, um, sport, in my opinion, profession. And, um, and that's first and foremost. So I think, um, I think the guys that have been, some have been um, made public, some have not been made public on, on guys in being interviewed. And um, I think a lot of our staff is worthy of being promoted uh, at some point, if it's not this year, the next year. And that just means you did a good job, right? As a staff. And um, as much as we'd hate losing those guys, um, I'm happy for them. Speaking of new hires, the you know, you guys brought in Peter Bendix to be the new president of baseball ops. Uh, he said that you guys met, you guys had dinner, just, you know, what, what are your initial thoughts on him? What did you guys, you know, from what you could tell us, what did you guys discuss in that dinner and, just your thoughts on, you know, what, what he's done thus far. Well, getting to know him was the the goal of that. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, me flying out there to Arizona and he really wanted to fly out here, uh, which is pretty cool. And uh, so, yeah, we went to dinner, spent, you know, a few hours together talking about everything. Um, family, the organization, players, um, everything you could you could think of you know we talked about um and we continue we talk every day that's the relationship with the gm and the or president of baseball ops and the um and the manager is that's that's the relationship you have to be, have communication on, on a daily basis in my opinion besides ownership and the gm or ownership and president that is the most important relationship uh, because it's a daily 6 a.m call during the season or off season it's an afternoon call and it's an evening after the game transaction move um so you are spending a ton of time uh with that person and um and peter seems like a great guy so far we've had uh, a lot of really good conversations it's only been a couple of weeks um but uh but so far it's been it's been really healthy he didn't uh waste too much time uh to start wheeling and dealing uh with his former club actually a couple new players on your roster skip um alan fauche uh, i assume he's just going to be right-handed relief depth for you guys uh i think the more interesting player is vidal brujan he hasn't been able to get it going yet against major league pitching yet what role do you envision vidal brujan um employing this season for the marlins we'll see uh i mean spring training is going to be big for a lot of the guys right yeah. some guys without options um, some guys that have to make a team or, you know, are going to find themselves in a different spot. Um, when you have, uh, you acquire more talent. Um, I think competition is always good. It brings out the best in guys and some guys run to the stage. Some guys run from it. Um, and I got, I want guys that run to the stage. They want the competition. They want the, um, uh, the, again, the, the competition of like, you know, it brings out the best or the worst in somebody, um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing both guys. Um, yeah. Right-handed reliever. Yeah. Good. But he's got a real curveball, a real slider. Um, he throws 96. Um, it's not just like this, uh, you know, random guy that we acquired. Like this guy, he's got real stuff. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing it live in a bullpen. You know, we got a really good uh, pitching coach and, uh, and Mel and beef, um, in, you know, in our, on our staff. And um, I'm looking to, forward to see what they can do with him. Um, Ruhan is, he's, done everything he can in the minor leagues, literally everything he can. Some guys just need a change of atmosphere um, and see what happens. And you just, you don't know, um, but he's got all the tools uh, and hopefully something clicks here. Uh, one of the other moves that I guess we were a little bit surprised about was the leaving Troy Johnson off the 40 man roster. I know that's not entirely your call either, but I was just curious your thoughts on that. If there's any conversation between you and the upper management about 
which guys to protect and which guys not to. Yeah, I don't have any conversation and, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the, the GM, the assistant GMs, the, or the front office, um, they know more about, you know, the protections and 40 uh, man roster and, you know, the minor league stuff. I, I look at guys on video. I, you know, I never, like I saw, you know, Troy and a few guys in spring training for a couple of weeks. And it's not really fair for me to give like this hot take other than like the video stuff that I look at. Um, Troy had a great year. Um, you know, we'll see what happens, but I think that, um, you know, that kind of roster management is, that's not what I'm, I'm good at right now because I'm so focused on, you know, the guys that I currently have and trying to figure out how to get them better and, and see what happens with different players in the off season. But, um, yeah, as far as the protection, that's, you know, that's the GM in the front office that, that does all that stuff. One of the players that were added was Anthony Maldonado, triple A guy throws heat slider fastball combo, just what do you know about him and just your thoughts on what you've seen thus far from, from someone like Maldonado who has a good chance to, to break that opening day roster? Yeah, we took a look at him, you know, pretty hard during the season last year as one of the options and, you know, got good reports. The game is about swing and miss. That's what it is uh, nowadays. You can get out of big spots if you have swing and miss stuff, uh, especially with the new rules. Um, balls put in play, um, get through now. I mean, Except for us, when we hit into double plays. But uh, everyone else, it feels like they they get hit. Uh, the balls get hit. They get through because of the new rules and the, the shifts. And I think the the what Maldonado has is a real slider that nobody can pick up. Um, he has a fastball that um, not too many people talk about, but the slider is really good because the fastball is good. Um, but when you cannot pick up a, a, a uh, the slider, the spin, it's kind of an outlier pitch. And when you know it's coming, and people still can't hit it, still can't hit it. Um, that's kind of a big deal. So, um, yeah, he's going to have a shot just like everybody else in spring training. We're excited about him. Um, and again, he was an option last year, um, you know, that was talked about through the AAA staff and our staff. Um, so we, yeah, we'll see what happens in spring training, but, you know, I'm excited that he's uh, a part of our club. In the, in that rotation, you, you mentioned, you know, we have Brax, you have Lizardo guys who hit career highs in innings pitch, just what was it like having to manage with that, you know, knowing that these guys maybe could deal with some fatigue, especially towards the back end of the season where, you know, at some points they were struggling, especially Luzardo at some times. And then Yuri as well, you had to deal with him. You know, you, you had mentioned that you weren't expecting him to come up as early as he did, but still found success. And to one point, you guys had to just keep going on without him, you know, if it was innings or injury. Yeah. Uh, you know, early on, I got heat for, Eli from Eli taking guys out early, but I don't think people understood that like this season is long and you have to protect some of these guys because stuff like that was going to happen. Right. So if I'm going seven innings with Brax and Lozardo in May and June, well, what's it going to look like in August and September when we also need to win those games. Right. Um, I think that there's, you, you have to understand that the, you it's a marathon. It's the long game. Yes. I want to win every single game. Don't get me wrong. But these guys were going to have career high innings. It just was going to happen. And uh, most people didn't realize that in March and April and May. But that was just going to be the reality because of what our staff looked like. Um, you had to prepare for somebody being injured. So it happens. Quite a bit of guys got injured, right? Um, I think we'll talk about the pit, pitch clock, I'm assuming, later. Um, but I do feel like that had something to do with a lot of the injuries this year. I've said it before. I'm been, it's been published or whatever recorded before that I just believe that the pitch clock is uh, does affect um, guys um, and injuries and uh, you know hopefully that doesn't happen and you know guys can build up accordingly this this off season um, to pre prepare for that but you know when guys are coming up on career high of innings and you, the depth will be tested um, and it was this year um, and I felt like Brax uh, learned to pitch through. Uh, not feeling 100%. I feel like Lazardo pitched through uh, through times where he didn't feel like he was going 100%. Some guys missed bullpens uh, that week so they could feel good during that game. Um, Yuri, yeah, I didn't expect him to come up so early. He did. Um, it was tough when, you know, he was um, uh, not with us and he got hurt towards the end of the year and we couldn't, he was coming up on his innings anyways, but, you know, ended up going through uh, something with his uh, back hip, um, had a back a hip issue. Um, but yeah, so we had to be creative with a lot of these guys and their innings, plus not crush our bullpen. Um, so we had to be really, really creative. Um, 
had a lot of input from, you know, Mel and our staff and Pipe, who, you know, my bench coach is, is as good as anybody and trying to figure this thing out together. Um, Rod Brahas was fantastic as well. Um, so I think, you know, trying to keep guys healthy um, was the biggest one. Trying to get them through uh, the first full season, not missing starts was a big one. Um, and not crushing our bullpen, which at times I felt like I did. And unfortunately, but, um, you know, it's tough to navigate, like, which way do you go? Do you, do you, your young pitcher, does that extra inning, uh, really matter? Or do you go with, you know, an established bullpen? So, and it, it was, uh, a learning curve for me as well. Like, I don't trust me. I don't feel like I have it all figured out. Um, but you're trying to do the best you can with the young staff and try to keep them healthy. And you mentioned Yuri and he pitched the most innings he's ever had in his career. Just how do you kind of manage that going into next season? Do you think he, will there be some sort of cap on Yuri or will you guys let him loose a little bit more? I I'm anticipating it'll be more than this year. Um, but I think you're always, you know, watching it, trusting your eyes. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to put like a number of innings that he's going to throw this year. Um, but you do understand that like he should be a senior in college, right? He's not, he's not 25 years old in his prime where you're just like going to run him out and he's built up and he's strong and um, he's strong. Don't get me wrong, but like, we just have to monitor it and be careful. Um, and, but I think, you know, we also, I, I think it's going to be different than last year. Um, but, you know, this guy has a bright future, uh, obviously, not only for him, but for our organization. Um, and so we're going to monitor everybody um, and especially uh, especially Yuri. Uh, but I don't think it will be like like last year. The winter meetings are in a few weeks uh, up in Nashville. I'm sure maybe we'll see you there. But I'm just curious at this point in the offseason, what needs do you think the, the team currently has uh, before they report to spring training? Well, I think that's up to Peter. You know, we talked to um, our whole staff and uh, the assistant GMs and trying to find ways to get better. Um, you know, I think the you can always get better on the mound depth wise. Um, you know, with Sandy being off or being gone uh, next year, um, you know, well, we do have some young guys that are coming off of injury that, you know, hopefully in spring training um, can open some eyes. Um Meyer being one of them. So we'll see what that looks like um, when he gets to spring. Um, our bullpen was really good uh, last year. I think they're only going to get better. Um, you know, guys uh, going to different facilities and working on stuff. Um, I'm interested to see what Ryan Weathers looks like coming into spring training. i um, excited about, you know, what, what, how he ended the last game in Pittsburgh, especially um, that somebody's going to, you know, be intriguing to me. Cabby, the last a uh, couple outings was pretty special. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully he can build off that. But as far as getting better, you know, offensively, we, we need to get better. Um, uh, trying to figure out, um, you know, Jazz having a full season. That would be awesome. <laughs> so how do we get him to have a really good offseason um, where he feels like he can play, you know, 150 games plus because when he's on the field, it changes everything. Um Hopefully, Avi Garcia uh, comes in the offseason, has a good, really good offseason, um, and see what that looks like in spring training. Um, our catching situation, obviously, Stalls is, uh, was non-tendered. Um, you know, Nick Fortes, we have some ideas on how to, uh, for him to get better. Um, he had a great season off uh, defensively. How does he move the needle um, on the offensive side? Um, can Sanchez get better against lefties? Um, so there's there's different ways with that just internally that we can get better at um, and figure out, you know, how we can get our own guys better. I just I hate the saying this is just who they are um, that that drives me nuts. Um, and so I, I just feel like, you know, maybe I believe in and I've said this before, maybe I believe in our guys too much. <laughs> um, but I think when you're a manager, that's what you're supposed to do is you really believe in your guys. And then what happens, you know, externally and whatever Peter decides to do, they decide to do, but I'm not looking like at every free agent and saying, Oh man, can we just get all these guys? Um, we had a really good season last year. Of course we can get better. Um, I'm not naive in saying like, that's just, we're just going to have the same roster. That's not going to happen. Um, but I do feel like, um, you know, we can get better in different areas, just our own guys and then see what happens free agency wise. You mentioned Jazz. Um, I assume I think it was a successful experiment. Him in center field, he really played well there towards the end of the season, especially. Do you guys do you envision him going back out there in 2024 to center field? Yeah, he started getting comfortable, um, you know, and then he got hurt. And then when he came back, he felt really comfortable out there. 
uh, he started to be a leader out there, which we wanted. Um, he started moving guys around, um, being more vocal, being more comfortable out there, going back, going in. His throws were really good uh, late in the season, uh, throwing guys out uh, at home, um, you know, through the cutoff, not over it and trying to throw everybody out. He's electric on the bases. Uh, guys were always, you know, like, oh, why aren't we running more? Well, we had a couple guys hurt. And Jazz had surgery. So, like, there wasn't – can't know everything, right? Uh, but th there's a reason why there are some guys that were were not running as much. Um, and, um, you know, I never disclose anybody's injuries because it's just that that's a personal thing. If they want to talk about it, they can. Um, but I think there's a reason why some guys were not running like, you know, they, they were used to running. Um, but I think that uh, Jazz, um, you know, getting better off lefties is going to be key for him as well. Um, he knows that and, um, you know, played him a lot, uh, you know, late in the year um, against lefties and hit a couple big home runs, um, had a couple big hits later. Um, but, you know, trying to be an everyday player is like been the message for Jazz and um, lefties, righties, whatever it is, because he's he changes the game in so many different ways. It's not just hitting lefties like he can run down things in the outfield that guys can't run down. He can change the bit, change the game on the bases. He can bunt. Um, uh, for hits and then all the next pitch, it's a double. Um, so I think um, there's different ways uh, Jazz helps us win games. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think that um, Jazz is a freak athlete. He can play probably anywhere. That's how good of an athlete he is. Um, he reminds me of like the, the freak athlete of like Tatis where we can just put him anywhere and he'll be a gold glover. Um, and I think Jazz uh, can be a gold glover in center field. Um, he just needs to play – you know, 150 um, to get the amount of innings out there to prove that he's uh, a gold glover out there. You've read my mind with the stolen bases situation. How many times this year did you guys ground into a double play because that guy was still on first? Jazz, when he was healthy, he ran at a pretty healthy rate, but he, he led the team in steals, even though he was out for so much time. Uh, a lot of guys, fewer attempts, despite the rule changes that made it easier for steals to happen. You guys were one of the few teams that had a drop-off in stolen bases compared to the year before. You won a lot of games, but obviously run scoring was an issue at times. So you, I guess you mentioned it about some perhaps health concerns that we're not privy to. But beyond that, was is there any thinking in your mind about as a manager and as your style, when your guys are actually healthy and available to run, that perhaps you'd be a little bit more aggressive in that aspect, yeah. especially yeah. to stay out of double plays and such. Sure. Who, so who would you want to run more? It's just – Who? Well, well, Birdie was the obvious one. Okay. So he he wasn't 100% all the time. So after that, go ahead. Garrett Hampson, he played a lot of the year, only five steals despite being one of the fastest guys on the team. Okay. And then, well, beyond that, we just <laughs> well, saw okay. across so my, my point is, is like you, your roster is your roster. Okay. Right. So I'm not stealing burger. I'm not stealing bail. I'm not stealing a rise. I'm not stealing stallings. I'm not going to steal De La Cruz. I'm not going to hardly steal Sanchez. That was our roster. Right. So I get what, like, yeah, like, why aren't we stealing more? I'm also like our offense with burger up and with bell up and with Slayer up and a rise up, like, four or five guys, I'm not willing, like it's hard to get on base, right? It's hard to get to first base. So I'm not going to run just to run for the sake of, oh, why aren't we stealing? Oh, let's run. And then all of a sudden Arias gets a hit or Slayer gets a double, Bell gets a double, Berger gets a double. And now we're standing on second. And why did you run? Why did you just, we're thrown out at second base. Do I think we can get better? Of course. Like, there is ways to get better on the bases. And that is one of the things that we have to figure out. How do we get better on the bases? We also have to get guys that can run the bases, right? So that's a big part of it. It's not just get on base and run. We hit and run probably more than any team in the big leagues. Yeah. That is not. Um, did we hit in double plays? Sure. But who was on first when we were hit, when we were hitting into those double plays, were those guys real true base stealers? A base stealer is a guy that the whole um, uh, stands or the all the fan base, every team knows they are stealing and they steal and they're safe. That is a base stealer. Okay, John Birdie was that guy last year for sure. Two years ago, last year he had some some uh, physical issues that he couldn't run for a, a lot of the not a lot of the time, but a month or changed of during the season. He had green light um, for the for whenever he was healthy. 
and he stole the bases when he was healthy. Um, do I think we can get better because the rule changes? Of course. Like, there's there's no doubt about we can get better, like, stealing bases, but you have to also, like, the roster of the Diamondbacks, for instance, had, like, Corbin Carroll and Thomas, and, like, they had some, like, real guys that were going to steal no matter what, and then you add on to the rules. Like, they were really creative on – you saw them and how they – uh, manipulated kind of the rules, the rules, and like we're bouncing off and getting picks, yeah. uh, more picks, and um, and then after the second pick they were going, after the first pick they were going. I mean, they they did a really good job of identifying um, that kind of thing. Dave McKay at first base is the best ever uh, at at uh, the base running and outfield. He, if there's one coach that should be in the Hall of Fame, it should be Dave McKay. Um, so he was really good at identifying some flaws in the system. We have to get better at that. There's no doubt. But I don't think like there's to run into outs on the bases is death. It is just death. Like whether it's stolen bases or first to third or getting uh, thrown out at home, like it, because it's so hard to get on base. Um, and I get it. I would love to get on base uh, more and steal. It creates more more uh, more runs being in scoring position. But I'm just not willing to risk with the with some of the guys that we had just. Sanchez just just run first move like that's that's not going to work for us right so um but I do feel like there are ways to get better um I know long-winded but there's there's a couple base stealers on our team and then everybody else has to be good base runners and I think that's what we have to get better at yeah uh speaking of Jesus Sanchez it's been a really interesting year for him an interesting career as well um the first month of the season, he really did not get many starts. I and then you know the rest of the year, he was really an above average hitter for you guys, one of your best power hitters in that lineup. What did you see from him after April that you decided to plug him in there every single day? I know there was injuries to Avi, um, but still, I think you were really impressed with him after April. Well, I think Brant Brown and John Mabry did a really good job of um, having Sanchez start using the whole field. Uh, there right. wasn't, you know, you could get him out um, in multiple ways when he was just trying to hit a ball 900 feet pull side. And he's got maybe the best power on our team. Um, but when he's only thinking that um, he was getting into some trouble um, and they were flipping him curveballs and he was just grounding out to first uh, and second base a lot and rolling over a lot of change ups uh, early on. And then, um, you know, we kind of he kind of bought into the use the whole field, middle of the field, whole field. And then you started seeing like opposite field home runs. And we were just hoping it was just going to be base hit doubles the other way, force the pitcher to get him more in the middle of the plate, middle in, so he could start juicing some balls. Um, but Sanchez ended up being a really good hitter, especially against righties. Um, and I couldn't take him out of the lineup, um, honestly, when it started, um, when he started hitting uh, against righties, especially. Um, so, you know, his next step now is, is he a platoon guy? I don't want him to be a platoon guy. He did. He played a really good right field, um, but that's that's kind of the next step for him. And um, I, we were struggling trying to get find left handers against righties. We were pretty deep, right, a pretty right handed uh, lineup at, at one point, and so trying to get lefties and matching up um, was important. And um, you know, he took the opportunity and ran with it. I mentioned when he's not trying to hit, you know, 900 foot home runs, he actually went through a pretty, like, I think it was a month and a half stretch where he did not hit a single ball over the fence, but yet he was still an above average hitter. His OPS was, you know, close to 800. Does that sort of tell you, Hey, he can really be effective offensively, even when he's not clearing the fence. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think there's so many different ways to get guys out when you only hit one way. Um, right. When you, when you show the ability to uh, manipulate the barrel, um, and be a hit collector, which which Brant Brown would preach to a lot of these guys. Uh, just collect hits. We'll figure out the power later. You know, you, you're going to run into home runs just by accident if you have a good swing. Um, and swinging at strikes, managing the strike zone, we was we preach. I think every team preaches it is you know winning the strike zone. You know, offensively and defensively, because um, usually whoever wins the strike zone wins the game. And I think he was the, um, you know, really good at identifying that um, and helping and it made him a bet much better hitter later in the year. Skip, one of the things that stood out during spring training, at least, was just we would see you a lot in the backfield, checking out those minor league scrimmages or just workouts. Just as someone who was, you know, obviously you in a minor leaguer for a while in your career and then you obviously came up, just 
for you to be out there and watch those guys and I guess get a sense of who, you know, who's in that farm system. Just what was that like for you to just do that during spring training? And is that some, you know, just to get more, more of a sense of the minor leaguers that are in your system? Yeah. I mean, I was drinking out of a fire hose, man. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know the system. I didn't know the front office. I didn't know the, our own players. All I knew was my own staff. Our own staff didn't know the minor league guys. Um, so we would go down and, uh, you know, instead of going home, we wanted to watch the games and watch these guys play. I wanted to watch how the coaches coached. Um, I wanted to know the farm director. I wanted to know the coordinators. I wanted to know everything on how guys were being developed. That was really important to me. This thing does not work if we don't have minor league, really good minor league players developed by really good minor league coaches. It just doesn't work. Um, and so I wanted to kind of sit back. I didn't want anybody's opinion. I wanted Pipe and I to just watch it or Rod and I or whatever. And I didn't want to hear anybody talk about any player. I just wanted to look at it from our lens and um, and sit back and just watch them go. Um, so, yeah, I um, – Listen, like you, you just don't know what a 17 or 18 or 19 year old kid's going to do. You don't know what a guy that just got drafted is going to do. Um, it takes guys to develop at different times um, in their careers. And um, I didn't develop till I was like 24, 25 years old. It just took me a long time. Um, so you don't know. Not everybody is Yuri Perez. Not everybody is Tatis. Not everybody is, you know, Jose Fernandez, like not everybody is just like going to take the world by storm in three years. And here you go at 21 years old. I hope there are some of those guys, but um, I think that was the majority of my, my thought when I got into spring training is like, I got to learn the organization. I got to know these players. Um, I got to start building relationships with these coaches. And I think when you are out there, it shows that you care too, because I don't, it's not fake. Like I do care about the, the minor league side. I know how hard it is. I know how hard those coaches work. Um, and it was, uh, so that was pro probably my goal more than anything in spring training. I guess throughout that time, is there anyone that stood out to you on the minor league side of things? Yeah. Yuri, Yuri stood out. No. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, f a couple guys I thought Fitterer, uh, when I was out there, um, probably stood out, uh, uh, the most, again, it was spring training, you know, I, it's, you can't, you can't fall in, in or out of love with someone in spring training. You just don't know where they're at timing wise. Um, Fitterer went to Elisa Niguel High School where I went. So that's why I, like, I, I wanted to go watch him anyways. Um, but he was uh, he, he stood out velo wise, could spin the ball. Um, so I thought that was uh, pretty intriguing. Um, uh, let's see. Capé was, uh, was pretty intriguing. Um, size wise looked the part. Um, I know we traded him, but Cleo Watson was, um, you know, the few games that I watched him um, uh, put some put some really good at bats together. Um, so like, the, but uh, when you're watching and watching, you know, kind of how they're being developed more than like who gets two hits in a spring training game. Right. Like you're trying to just see how guys are uh, taken to coaching, how guys are coaching them um, and trying to get the development part right. One last thing for me, Skip, uh, entering last season, you made a point of not having a set closer entering the season. And over the course of the season, it changed over a few times due to injuries and inconsistencies. But for most of the year, Tanner Scott was a monster near the end of the games. And of course, he was closing games down the stretch. When he has that kind of really um, spectacular year that he had in 2023, does that change your thinking a little bit entering 2024, considering how special he was? Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens in the offseason. Um, the reason why we were so good late in the games to me is because we used him in the meat of the order a lot. Um, and the ninth inning is different. I totally understand the ninth inning is a different animal. And I've said it before, like some guys run to the stage, some guys run from it. He definitely didn't run from anything. He wanted the ball every single day. And the, the amount of work that he put in um, behind the scenes, I don't think people realize how, how much he cares. And um, whether it was reports or the weight room or the training room or whatever, like he was going to make himself available that night somehow. Um, and it was really tough on me a lot of times to say you're down today. He was like, what? What do you, I'm not down today. There's no way I can throw. I'm good. Um, but you had to like, you know, set him down, set him down uh, sometimes because, um, and it was hard, but because you, you know, you care about his health and his career, but we, we don't get to where we get to without putting him against the two, three, three, four, five uh, part of the order, which we did 
the entire year. Um, it just so happened that, um, you know, late in the year, um, you know, we acquired some guys that uh, felt like we could use in those spots at times, and then we could put Tanner in the ninth inning. But yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I got no problem with putting Tanner, um, you know, in the, in the closing role again. Um, but again, we, we were really good because of what he did in the heart of the order majority of the games. Well, that'll do it for us, Skip. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate the time. From Isaac, from Eli, from Skip, myself, we'll see you guys all in two weeks. Peace out and go fish. All right. Thanks, guys.